Good morning, good afternoon, and for our speaker, uh, good evening. I know it's awfully late there in the Seychelles, so thank you for being with us. Uh, our speaker today is Andrew Rylance. He's a technical advisor for on protected area finance and economics uh, with the UN Development Program and the Global Environment Facility in, in Seychelles. And he is going to be talking to us today about business plans for uh, marine protected areas. So uh, really glad to have him, and I'll introduce in just a second but before I do I just wanted to mention that we are going to keep uh, today's webinar brief so we're gonna have about 15 minutes of presentation and 15 minutes of Q&A and we plan to wrap up at uh, 1:30 Eastern Time so Andrew as I mentioned is a technical advisor to the government of Seychelles and UNDP and the Global Environment Facility on the protected area financing project and they recently held a business planning workshop to support the future of protected areas of the Seychelles which we thought had global application and so we wanted to invite Andrew to share with us so he's going to be talking about um, the importance of business planning for protected areas and how these can be used as tools to leverage financial support so welcome and thanks for being with us thank you very much Okay, well thank you everybody. Um, I'll just crack on with the presentation. Um, it's quite late here, it's 10 o'clock in the evening, so sort of five hours ago Seychelles looked like the photo you can see in front of you, which is um, Curious Marine Protected Area. And I promise to keep the uh, number of annoying, annoyingly beautiful beach photos to a minimum, except that one of course. Um, and so I've just got a 15 minute presentation and I wanted to, although a business planning um, training takes somewhere between three to five days. I just wanted to give a taste for park managers, but also those interested in business planning. Um, the importance of business planning for protected areas to provide that justification for, for protected area managers. Um, some of the components which are involved in business plans and to give some examples from uh, marine protected areas globally and then also just provide some informational resources uh, which we found were very useful during our training and we're trying to make uh, available globally. So just as a very brief introduction just to know the context of where of how we got to the demand for, for business plan training is uh, I'm the technical advisor for this for a five-year um, global environment facility funded project which is implemented by the government of Seychelles in partnership with the United Nations Development Program and our real aim is to try and improve the financial sustainability and strate uh, strategic cohesion within the Seychelles protected area system and so my real question going towards business planning is what was the importance for the protected areas in Seychelles and one of our major outputs that we developed early on was a, a system level financial plan where we had to determine what the financing gap was that our protected areas needed to try and close and effectively in order to improve levels of biodiversity in the protected area system we needed we need to be able to double the level of financing and uh, we found that 68% of all revenue generated is at a site level so improving site level business plans was quite important and that, from that we found also that the organization with the largest funding gap was that managed by the government's um, protected area agency which is Seychelles National Park Authority so the next step for us was really to develop a strategic plan for this organization looking at its long-term financial future and really this planning document focused on how can it can strengthen its management effectiveness and efficiency of its resources how could we ensure that its generated revenue went directly back into park management? How could we upgrade the tourism facility in order to attract uh, more tourists but also do it in an environmentally sensitive way? We needed also to be able to develop partnerships with the private sector as well as create enjoyable spaces for Seychellois people and their families to directly connect with nature. And we also wanted to Financing protected areas um, is sometimes a challenging topic. People want to know why they should invest more money into protected areas. And so we wanted to design tools as well that engage citizens with the idea of using protected areas as a bank of nature where everybody generates benefits um, through various activities, whether it be employment opportunities but also social areas for people to engage. 
And so this brought us to our business planning process. And um, these are uh, examples of where our teams are in Seychelles working on it. And what I want to go through is um, some justification on the importance, the process, and then the resources that we used for it. So just a very quick introductory to this. Um, the status of business planning in protected areas. We actually found when we were developing this process, and I've done this in a few countries now, trying to determine where business plans are and who's doing them. And one really interesting study in 2012, that so as you can see, surveyed 135 MPAs, found that 49% didn't actually have a, a financing strategy. And a, a probably more worryingly, an additional 25% were unsure if they had a financing strategy. So that then shows the importance that maybe MPAs don't, not enough MPAs, either have a financing strategy or, or, or see a, a, a need, a demand for one. Um, so really the punchline is with this, is that a financing strategy doesn't guarantee your financing needs will be met, but it certainly does increase the possibility that you get closer to your achievements, you get closer to the objectives that you want to achieve. And then determining what exactly is a business plan. Um, as you will see from the resources that I that I come to a bit later, there are many different definitions how you want to um, describe a business plan. But in its simplest terms, um, we found the most useful way of communicating is that, is that it's a strategic way to plan and communicate the financial future of your organization. You, you need to know how much financial resources you need in order to then achieve your conservation targets, which is your ultimate objective. And then you need to know what is the most effective way in order to match the two. And as you see from the figure in front of you, sometimes it can feel a bit like a minefield, plotting your way through obstacles with, a, with the uh, metaphorical ring of fire around you, trying not to fall off. And as you'll see, as I go through this presentation, um, there's no one size fits all for, for a business plan. Um, knowing what you want to use it for in the first instance is often the most important step because it guides the rest of your process. So some government um, MPAs will use it just to justify next year's budget support, which in itself is fine. But there could be um, additional or greater reasons behind it. An MPA could be facing a change in role of its organization. If you've got an, an MPA expansion, for example, if you're following a marine spatial planning process and you're, you're in a period of flux with your organization. Um, if you're a new MPA and you want to be able to uh, either justify why you should become an MPA and how you can be self-financing, um, or you just want to know what are the first steps in order for you to meet your basic financing needs. You can also use this as an advocacy tool, either for existing funders to show that you have become increasingly efficient. You can use it as a marketing tool for new funders to attract more investment. But you can also determine it as a way of demonstrating the return on investment um, for your um, return on investment either to existing funders or to the wider population. Um, an example of how this can be used um, here is from Laughing Bird Key in Belize, where they have a really um, nice way in their business plan where they actually determine what the return on investment is for every dollar in, um, invested in the park. They, they show the multiplier effect of visitation in the park and the importance that the, the MPA provides for the wider economy. And we know, and I know that um, the, the US national parks as well as um, Finland and Brazil and South Africa all try and do this um, determining what the contribution of tourism in the protected areas is to the wider economy. So it acts as a very useful advocacy tool as well. And so if you're at the start of your business planning process, you've decided who you want to target. Um, how do you initiate this? The first question is really, when do you want to write the plan? And often you can write this immediately after you develop your management plan, or you can write it in tandem, depending on how, how you feel the situation is. Um, the time frames, often it's between five and 10 years. And when you establish a team, what's quite important this is, is that um, you take a, a, a a leveled approach to it. You work through the levels of support, both at the strategic level immediately with the CEO and the board members, using the financial management team, as well as using your PA managers on site, who will help you determine the practical application of your ideas. 
um, whether, for example, cost savings are, are viable, uh, sorry, whether cost savings are possible, and whether specific on-site financing mechanisms are viable. Um, it's also very useful to, to try and reach out and have an external advisory group. We found this has been very useful, acting as effectively a sounding board for your ideas. Um, they can just shed um, a different perspective on the same issue, which can certainly help. Um, it will also build greater buy-in for when you finalize your plan. And it's important to agree the process um, with deliverables in the same way in which you would um, try and complete a consultancy contract, for example. But adaptive management is key in these in this process. And a number of the guidelines which you'll be able to view will have different processes in which you want to uh, follow. This again will entirely depend upon your, your organization and, and your, your political social environment. But two key factors that really um, stand out in this process is this period of honest reflection and strategic planning. Once you've been through your first round, it's really useful to take a step back and have a, and have an honest reflection, an honest self-reflection of the organization of can you actually implement what you think you need to do? Right? What's the, is the capacity ability of the organization sufficient in order to do this? Are there easier alternatives? Um, and that's sometimes left out both in management plan, both in business plans, but also in management plans, which make them um, very difficult to implement. The second part is obviously um, is the seeking external advice and feedback, which I've already discussed. And then often a question we get is, what level does a business plan have to be at? Um, and that's quite a tricky topic. Uh, that's quite a tricky subject, where it's really up to the organization. You can either have it at a, at a site level for an individual PA, or you can have it at an institutional level. For example, if an institution manages a series of MPAs that all have similar types of revenue generating opportunities and have significant shared costs throughout the institution, it maybe makes more sense. In, for, for that instance, and also the language of what you call it. In some countries, calling it a business plan for a protected area is rather sensitive. Um, the question over whether protected areas should be um, generating money themselves, so sometimes they're called financial strategies, and sometimes institutions, in call, instead of calling them business plans for the institutions, refer to them as strategic plans. Sometimes these are just a bit more acceptant. And then if I move on to the core of this presentation, looking at the components of a business plan. Again, a common theme throughout this is there's no fixed formula. It depends on what you want to achieve. It depends on the level of financing you require. If your financing gap is small, um, your vision and, and how innovative you have to become is, is much less. Um, and also, if your current development of financing options is quite developed, then that has a different bearing on what your plan will look like as well as the experience of your team. Ultimately, it is your PA team that's going to have to implement this, so having a plan which reflects their capacities and experience is very important. And so with this in mind, um, what we have done in the Seychelles and what we've done previously is try to come up with a, a, a structure for a business plan. And again, it changes depending on, on which guideline you try and use. Um, and this is too much of a, uh, this is too long for me to go through in detail, but what I wanted to do is just highlight a few of these sections and give you some examples of either tools that have been used that you can use in the future or examples of how it's been applied in other MPAs globally. And so the first one of this is, is a financial analysis. If you're going to implement a financial analysis, which is incredibly important within your protected area, what it does is it helps you determine the long-term investment uh, and operating costs for the protected areas. And you can then use it as well to develop scenarios. So you can determine whether you uh, a scenario based on your basic functions and then your optimal management effectiveness functions. And MedPAN, which is an organization which supports Mediterranean marine protected areas, developed a an online tool, um, which I can share the link after this with, where you can effectively have a download a spreadsheet and you can help develop a, and it helps you develop your financial analysis um, which looks something like this which is used for an MPA in, in Albania 
and it helps you work through a 10-year planning process and helps you individually work through the process of all the human resources, maintenance, others, and investment costs that you might need. And as you go through your plan and you go through your series of reflections during um, and monitoring and evaluations through the plan, you can update this spreadsheet. The planning tool also helps you break it down by, but by programs, which is also very useful because as a first glance, you can then see if you're over budgeting on one, air, on one programmatic area versus the others. And therefore, you can start adjusting as you go through. So that's also very useful for protected areas. The next area that I want to go through is actually, this often gets um, neglected in, in business plans for protected areas. They often go from the financial analysis and then decide what can they, okay, how much money can they then make to achieve that financial analysis? And it, and it misses a trick that first the important aspect would be to look at how you can make cost savings, how you can improve cost sharing and subsidization through between protected areas, how you can develop partnerships with the private sector and alliances either with donor organizations or with research institutions in order to reduce the financing gap that you then need to find revenue in order to achieve. Um, and that's, that's really helpful and increasingly with um, protected areas increasing in number but also in volume and levels of financing remaining relatively stagnant, this is becoming an increasingly important area of, techni of technical work. And an example where this has been applied <coughs> in a nature park in Slovenia looked at, they, they use this as a really strategic area of their business plan where they wanted to look at um, volume purchases to get economies of scale and stockpiling resources, um, extending the useful lifespan of their goods by placing an emphasis on preventative maintenance, um, balance their staff time and their contracting between when they actually needed, they found that they were having um, periods of dead time when they had a whole series of full-time staff when actually they needed less full-time and more part-time in, in, in um, seasonal periods of high visitation. They looked at efficiency of the financial and administrative systems, it was largely paper-based and moving online, as well as opportunities for contracting out services which weren't deemed necessary to keep in-house or could be contracted out to the private sector without having a negative impact on biodiversity. And then once we move on to the financing plan, um, we could be here for another three days discussing all, all the different financing mechanisms which you could potentially look through um, and there are some good tools to, to, be, to be using. What I wanted to do is once you've decided what option, financing options are available, you're going to need to um, prioritize. Um, so what I wanted to do just quickly is just give you two ways in which you could prioritize or two methods that you could prioritize your financing options and then look at how you can plan those against scenarios. So the first one, which is a very basic one, which is again an example from Belize, where they take their recommended strategies and they weigh it up in a matrix of relative impact versus relative complexity. And then using your stakeholder group, you'd be able to determine whether you have strategies that you can pursue quickly or whether they're opportunistically or ones that you could defer to a much later date. So that will just help with um, effectiveness levels for your organization. If you wanted a bit more detail, and a more detailed approach you could use is developing a set of criteria um, which can then help you through your prioritization where you can include aspects of social acceptability, technical feasibility and potential returns in order to help with your ranking. And then developing a, so once you have your financing options, um, you will have a blended menu of options and then determining under what scenarios do you think these could be developed. And this would help you determine, it's always useful to not just say, okay, well, it will generate X amount for us. There are many variables that will determine whether it, a visitation goes up, for example. So trying to determine what would be your best case and your worst case scenario can help you also create a bit of a buffer. Um, so that you know that in bad peri periods of downturn or financial difficulty, you at least know you will get 
as high as you can towards your financing target. Um, it can also help you offset against different financing solutions. Um, so you can you can also help. Yes. So here we have that you can you can develop um, different development options, and it helps you evaluate against them. But it can also help you justify the need to change by predicting what would happen under a business as usual scenario. So you could also use it in that sense as the opportunity cost of not doing anything. What would be the situation in the future? And an example where this has been used is a, a marine protected area in Mozambique called Karimbas. And what they tried to do is look at their uh, their park revenue generation projections and they used, they took from their actual tourism revenue and tried to determine what would be their worst case, medium case and best case scenario um, just to try and provide some leeway to see based on a, a very, on a number of external factors what could be the impact. And so my final two bits of this presentation is what does it really take to complete a, a business plan? Obviously, you need the involvement of the conservation officers. They'll help you identify where cost savings could be generated on the ground, but they'll also act as a, re a useful reflection on the viability of on-site collection mechanisms. Um, you need good financial data, obviously, um, but this can either be historically from your own protected area, or if you're a new protected area, then you can use comparative data from another site. Decision makers need to be involved throughout the process, um, not just the CEO of the organization, but if you have a board or you have a governing um, government institution, having their buy-in to the process of a business plan and the potential results before you start is critical. They're much more likely to accept the results if they have agreed with your process um, and they, they buy into your strategy. And then obviously you need staff. Um, you need your staff to take ownership of the plan. It needs to be built from the bottom up because in, um, invariably they will be the ones trying to drive it. Um, and a couple of colleagues have asked me, well, how long does it take? So my guess, my best guess, is at least three months, but it varies depending on complexity, the number of sites, the number of stakeholders, the availability of data, um, the length of span which it takes for you to get through your consultation process or what the legal requirements are for your for your business planning process. And my very last slide um, to finish on is what we found was very useful in this process for managers is they wanted to be able to understand what the final output would look like before we began the process. Um, and so what we did, and this is really a collaborative effort between a number of professionals in our in our field, is we try to collect together as many business plans um, as we could find. And actually, uh, people or organizations that I thought would have them, we actually found that they were less available. So, um, which brought us to the conclusion that actually this is an important resource to be able to share, not just keep in Seychelles, but share globally. Um, because then it might also then encourage more protected areas to go through this business planning process. And what, we're, what we've agreed with UNDP and, and BESNET is to um, host this on their websites and this will be up and running next week and I'll forward the, um, the web link for, 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 this, for this group. And it contains within it guidelines as well as individual business plans based on um, different regions. And what I'm hoping with UNDP and BESNET, I'm sure they will do, is allow for more business plans as people find them to continue to integrate it into it. Um, and we found this is very useful for the protected area managers where they can effectively go through the business plans now. They can see specific sections where they, where they think, okay, that, I like the way that is presented. That answers a question that I have. I want to reflect that in my business plan. So they can pick and choose. And we found that's been quite an effective way of, of um, engaging our protected area managers. So that's all for, for my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. And then if anybody has any follow-up questions or you'd like to know more about either what the project is doing or what UNDP Jeff um, protected area projects are doing globally. I'm happy to engage in that. So, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was a great overview. And I'm going to invite people to go ahead and send their questions in through the question box on the webinar interface. Uh, we have just a few minutes. And 
In the meantime, I wanted to ask a question just to get us started. I know a lot of times protected area managers are concerned about business planning because they worry that uh, it provides an excuse for governments to uh, reduce their support to protected areas. How do you address that? It's a very good question and um, in the countries that I've worked in that's always kept coming up. The advocacy for protected areas to generate more revenue the government feels as though it is then potentially an opportunity for them to reallocate budget support to other areas. Um, what's, what's probably important to note um, is that how would you really describe this is that protected areas are fundamentally still dependent upon government budgets. These business plans will never just replace the, gov um, the revenue. Government budget support pr provides very important core funding for, for their staff in order to meet, um, for example, recurrent costs. Um, if you're heavily dependent upon self-financing, for example, from tourism, and you have a significant tourism shock, that can have a significant negative impact on your protected area. So that would be my communication to government that these should be seen as additional sources, but they're not replacement sources for, for government budget support that deals with core recurrent costs. Thanks. So we have a question from uh, Miguel Figueroa who asks, can you please share the link to the online tool for developing financial analyses, the one that, for the Mediterranean? I think that was on one of your slides. Yes, absolutely. So what I can do with Joanne after this is I can email her the web link to the MedPan and I can also attach the Excel spreadsheet that MedPan generously um, shared with us for our business planning. Um, it's it, it's quite a it's quite a, a, a robust system, but it can't be sort of expanded too much. But it gives a very good guideline that you can then use yourself. Okay, great. And uh, there's another comment. Have you heard of the open standards for the practice of conservation? I find it quite useful to structure business planning processes. And uh, he gives a he gives a website, which for those who are interested is uh, cmp-openstandards.org. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Andrew. No, I haven't come across that, but yeah, more more links where we can um, share information and build upon those different guidelines and different processes was really useful. And I think a couple of other questions just about if you do have suggestions for other resources where managers can find financing uh, resources. Uh, for where they can find resource, resources. Well, um, one very good catalog is through the UNDP Biofin, which is the Biodiversity Finance Initiative. Um, you can find their web link by just typing in UNDP um, Biofin or UNDP Biodiversity Finance. They have a um, they, they have a catalog. I don't know if it's live yet, but it's certainly in their methodology. As well as if you go onto the UNDP website, um, under sustainable development, they have an aspect under environmental finance, where they have a very large drop-down menu of different financing methods um, in there. Um, as well as in the um, in this web link, which we'll show you for the BESNET in the guidelines as well, they also give a breakdown of types of financing options available for protected areas. Okay, and of course you can go ahead. Sorry, and just to say, and of course you can read through all of the business plans because they go through which financing options have been available to them. So you could find a comparative site and a comparative region, and then learn more about what they've been doing. Okay, and I just wanted to say we have several more questions. I know we're not going to have time to get to all of them, but we will pass them on, and Andrew, perhaps you can follow up with people offline. Um, but the, the last question is, do you have suggestions for sources of revenue other than tourism in places where tourism is not uh, feasible? Yes, so depend, I mean, it, it completely depends upon uh, what your site is. Um, but for example, I know there is a growing trend um, for um, red initiatives, for biodiversity offsets, for payments for water system, uh, watershed management services, especially for upstream farmers. Um, 
in multiple use zones, if you have an MPA where, there, where you are allowing fisheries as well, there is a growing market around impact investment. Um, seems to be one of the major growing areas. Um, and again, there is a UNDP link on impact investing on those sites um, where you can begin to learn. And this, that's a relatively new area, um, but that's where additional non-government streams look into trying to generate a financial return where money is linked to also good environmental practice. Great. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. We really appreciate you taking the time. It was a great overview. And for all who are interested, it will be posted on open channels. So if you want to take a look at it or share it with others, it will be there. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you indeed.